So this is today we're going to cover what I would have covered Wednesday morning in class. And this will be just a short um, discussion on communication in really close relationships. We talked about dynamics of communication yesterday. And then you will have the movie for the in-class exercise and the sheet. Um, I'm actually going to do that on a separate link so that you don't, um, if you need to go back and watch the movie, you can go back and and put the movie on without having to go through the lecture thing again. So communication in close relationships, there are some very unique parts of how we communicate with each other in very close relationships and how people are able to stay together for a long period of time. Cornell University has done several studies actually, but their research shows that our close relationships, so significant others, really close best friends, you know, the, the, the super close people that we disclose everything with, that we share everything with, um, that we really develop strong bonds with, those are the single most important sources of satisfaction in our lives and it have that has the biggest impact on our emotional well-being and that that doesn't matter what culture you're from it doesn't matter what age group or age range whether you're really old like me or young like y'all um our close relationships are the thing that's the number one thing we use to value our life it means the most important to us and it shows that even though we can function on our own, our happiness and our overall satisfaction and health is dependent on having at least some really close relationships. As, we, as we've talked about, introverts may only have a couple of really close friends, but those bonds are critical. And extroverts, of course, are feel like they're close friends with everybody, and it does the same kind of effect for them. Now, just to show some examples, I, I think in class I talked last week maybe about um, Rosalind Carter when she died last week, uh, President Jimmy Carter's wife. They'd been married 77 years. How in the world do people stay together that long? That's That's an incredible amount of time. This couple in front of you, this is from back, I think it's 2015, um, and it's the knees family and his name is hugh he's 94 in this picture her name is joan she's 92 and at this particular point they'd been married 67 years so 10 years shorter than the carters but it's exactly the same point and they had such a tight bond that they had said to each other and they had said to a lot of their friends as well they had no desire to live without the other, and they wanted to die together. And quite interestingly, they died two, two hours apart. Uh, Joan died. They were in a hospital. They had to both go to the hospital for different reasons. And since they were married, they put them in the same room and they pushed the beds together. And they were holding hands and Joan died. And then two hours later, Hugh died. And it it goes to show you how strong a bond some relationships can have that it's so strong that people don't want to live if the other one's not there and this is a, a pretty unique example but there are a lot of examples out there where couples have made that kind of commitment and they do die really close together in time sometimes it's like this and it's a mere couple hours apart sometimes it's a couple of days um maybe a few months at most, but really strong bonded couples um, have no real desire without the other one. And that's that's a pretty interesting fact. Now, what's even more amazing is trends in the United States don't really support long-term relationships. The, the trends are saying that we tend to go for much shorter relationships, as you'll see in a minute, the divorce rate, and this is from 2018, I think it is. This is the last time I actually pulled all of these numbers together. The divorce rate in the United States is 44. No, I pulled it in 2021. 
The divorce rate in the United States is 44%. It was 51. So that's actually good. We're seeing divorces go down. Some of that could be related to the fact that we're not seeing as many marriages go up because that's also a trend that we're seeing. But that's still a pretty high rate. I mean, that's almost 50% of all marriages wind up in a, in a divorce. The average U.S. marriage that ends in divorce lasts eight years. That's really not very long when you think about it. I mean, the knees were 67 years. Um, these are some pretty pretty sad numbers. And this one's a real shocker. In the state of New York, it's now legal to file divorce papers through Facebook Messenger. You don't even have to hand the person divorce papers or have a sheriff you know, deliver it or anything like that as a legal maneuver. You can just send divorce papers along via Facebook Messenger on, in the state of New York, at least. And that is considered as formally filing for divorce. They've made it that simple. And it seems to be an easy way out that people take a lot of times, which means the marriage obviously doesn't have that deep commitment. Now, one encouraging thing about this is the divorce rate is going down. Like I said, um, these numbers, I think, are 2021. I previously had 2015 numbers, and the U.S. divorce rate was 51%. So that's a pretty decent drop right there, you know, 7% reduction in divorce rate. Um, the U.S. has saw the divorce rate drop among 18% among Gen X and millennials. So it's the baby boomers, actually my generation, because I'm a baby boomer, um, that has the higher divorce rate, and we're seeing that go down. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one is the, sh the trends show that especially in the 20s and early 30s, we're not seeing nearly the amount of people getting married that they used to see. The trend has significantly dropped in getting married. And I know in class discussions, I've heard people talk about the fact that they aren't really interested in getting married because of all of the hassles that are tied to it. So when you see marriages go shorter or you see less marriages, then obviously you're going to see the, the divorce rate drop as well. And people are making different kind of commitments. They're still bonding with people. They're just not getting married. Um, but that is a pretty good trend. It says that the younger generations are doing a better job, at least those that get married, than the older generations um, actually did. What also is an interesting trend, and then this is, I, I didn't know this until I started teaching this class, but I thought it was rather interesting. Friendships between males and females that are just platonic friendships has really not been a thing in the history of, of humans. Um, it's really not been a thing until recent times, which is kind of interesting. Studies show that most people have way larger same-sex friend groups than cross-sex friend groups. So men have more men friends than they do women friends. Women have more women friends than they do men friends. That's really not a surprise. And back you go way back in early man times, other than for procreation, the two sexes very rarely um, encountered each other or, or were friends with each other. And women tend to bond more in a one-on-one -on -one type of interaction. So women will have one really close friend and then another really close friend and they interact with each other just on a one-to-one -one basis. Men tend to do it in groups. So you'll have four or five men together as in a group being a bond. And rarely will you see two men that are super close together that always do stuff together. Um, for whatever reason, lots of there's a lot of factors that come into play with that. This study, though, takes a look at platonic cross-sex friends and how hard that is to maintain. But the real reason I like showing this video. If you remember in the last discussion, we talked about exchange theory and comparison value. And exchange theory was that we're always looking at costs and benefits. And what is this relationship costing me versus the benefits I get out of it versus this other relationship and the cost and benefits there? And in this video, the guy that's sort of moderating it is going to ask them what each person, what do they need from their platonic friend relationship? But then they ask a question that we rarely ever ask ourselves, 
what do you think the other person needs out of this relationship? And the difference in the response is, is pretty significant. So we'll show that and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Has it something that in, in your relationship, either of you have acknowledged at one point and brought up sex? Are you attracted to me at all? Like us talking about sex? Us talking about yeah, sex just together? That, that... Can guys and girls be just friends? Can they do it in spite of attraction? What if you find yourself in the friend zone? What about friends with benefits? What? As you can see, this all gets complicated. Fast. Cross-sex friendships are actually shockingly recent to human history. It's really only annoyed us for the past 1% of our existence, only like a few thousand years. Before that, for the first 99% when we were mostly nomadic, there's almost no ethnographic evidence of men and women having platonic friendships. But even though we're not wired for it, socially, we are way ahead of the curve. Men and women work together, learn together, and socialize together. So if you want to thrive in the modern world, you better get good at having platonic friends. Now, at their core, friendships are a social exchange. Each of you has needs, and the trade's got to be fair. When two people's needs are very different, one person usually gets hung out to dry. Now, if you need someone to be more than a friend, but they only need a friend, you might feel trapped in a friend zone. What about if you're in a friends with benefits relationship and you develop a need for emotional support and commitment, but your partner's just content with the physical side? We so often find ourselves on one side of the fence because we only know what we need out of a friendship, but we never even think about what the other person's needs are. So today, we gathered a group of male-female friends and had them take a crack at awkwardly figuring it out. So we have here a board of needs. Okay. And we want you to consider looking over all this uh, in your friendship, what you need out of that. What I need from a friendship. Yeah, things that you need from this friendship. Go ahead, take your time, consider what you want. When you do, just put them in a the circle, all right? Okay. Go for it. Okay. That's an easy one. Criticism. Criticism. So, what do we have? Well, I have a lot of needs. I picked money, humor, stimulating conversation, dependability, optimism, romance, <laughs> in the platonic way. He's like a romantic guy. Keep me sharp and focused, okay? Criticism. And ear to complain to. And healthy competition. Okay. Since everyone was such a pro at talking about their needs, we had them take a stab at telling us what the other person needs out of the friendship. Here we go. Again, I won't overthink it. I'll just throw it on there because I could keep reshuffling many, many times. Okay. Have you ever really considered what it is that she might need out of the friendship before? Or was this the first time? This probably would be the first time. <laughs> it's kind of sad. Was it difficult to pick these five up? It was a little tougher. I feel like in friendships, it's this like system of checks and balances where it's like, all right, I want to make sure that I'm getting my needs met, and I'm not really thinking about if they have their, if they're getting their needs met. Um, so it was nice to be able to actually think about like what Matt does want from me and a friend, even if I totally ignore it. <laughs> I guess I've never really thought about what he needs from me. I. I guess I'm just selfish. Do you think most people only consider their own needs in a, in a relationship? Well, now I'm thinking that probably, yeah. All right, Jared, Jennifer, what we have here is two Venn diagrams. The one over here on the left, this is what each of you thinks the other person needs. And the one on the right is what you each said you yourselves need. So looking over all this information, seeing that you kind of seem to understand what each other needs, how do you think that affects your relationship with each other? I think that's probably why we're such good friends, and that's why it's just easy being friends. That's why we're staying good friends. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything specific that you guys get out of male-female relationships that you don't get out of relationships with members of the same sex? 
Yeah. Just a different perspective, a different point of view. Because I really, like, We've had these conversations. <laughs> what's going through dudes' brains. And I feel like, Alex, what does this weird thing mean? In my female relationships, I can be emotional and they get it. Whereas, like, I think of, like, going out to lunch with my guy friends and they're like, huh. Hey, how's it going? What's up, man? Why do you think a lot of people seem to have uh, difficulty with male-female friendships? Um... It's easy. Sex. It's sex, yeah. 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 Self-control. Sex. People. Because hormones. Hor <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think really it just basically comes down to a matter of self-control and respecting the other person so much. You don't need to try to stick your thing in every. Thank you! <laughs> it, uh, complicates things. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just because one person might be attracted to the other person, you know, doesn't mean that you have to act on it, you know, if you value their friendship enough, you know. That's the big part is um, momentary pleasure does that defeat long term rewarding, fulfilling relationships. What we found was really interesting. Not only did almost all of these cross-sex friends feel some attraction towards each other, they had openly discussed it, and then opted to continue the friendship without moving into a romantic relationship. Why? Because they realized the benefits of these particular friendships outweighed those of a relationship. Are there benefits to just being friends that you don't get out of a, a relationship? Yeah, because there's not, I mean, there's less of a responsibility, I guess. With boyfriends, I feel like it's always like, the relationship, let's talk about the relationship. Like, make sure the relationship, what's up with our relationship, the next level. And like, with you, it's like, whatever. It just is what it is, you know? There's not a lot of maintenance that I have to do to like, maintain a friendship with you. I'm Besides just be myself. In romantic relationships, um, where there is sex involved, a lot of times, a lot of it gets shifted and get put heavily on sex. Um, to where with Jennifer and I, there's no sex involved. There is so much focus on a lot of these things that we both, you know, pick because that is what we share together and all of the intensity stays right there. I love that I don't want to have sex with you. I wake up every day and I'm like, thank God I don't want to have sex with you because then we can keep being friends, you know? And you're able to fight your attraction off me. Yeah, I'm able to fight my attraction to her that I can't bear. Are you attracted to me at all? Yeah. Is this a question? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to know. I mean, I think you're I think you're attractive. Has there ever been an attraction between you two? I'm totally attracted. He's like uh, a beautiful person. Just because it's there doesn't mean that you have to engage in it. And we are we're open about it. Like it's not something that we try and act like doesn't exist because you know anytime you try and suppress any emotion or anything you're thinking, it ends up just bubbling up and being even more so than what it originally is. I just think just having trust and just being open and just going with it. And just in today's time, you want good friendship with opposite sex. Attraction only breaks a friendship if you let it. Feeling attracted to somebody isn't your choice, but addressing it is. The key isn't to repress it, but to acknowledge that it exists. Whether or not you confess it to them, it's totally your call but so is letting it stop you from having friends of the opposite sex. So figure out what you both need out of the friendship by considering how it looks from the other person's side. It's worth it for you to understand what's in it for them. I'm Julian, and this has been The Science of Love. A little dramatic there at the end. I like that look of okay what do you need out of a friendship and you see how fast they can put stuff up and in some cases it's a lot of stuff right and then when he says okay what do you think your friend needs out of this relationship and all you hear is just silence and crickets because we don't typically think about that but all of this is focused on that whole concept of the exchange theory and our balance all the time of what costs and benefits we get out of each relationship and how much do we need that relationship compared to another relationship and the cost and benefits in that particular one. And we typically don't think about what is the other person's view of their balance. of what, what do they need from me that I need to be giving them? And then also, what is their balance level? Because as I said last class, 
in the exchange theory, we all decide what is the balance. For some people, it's equal amount of cost to benefits. So other people have, they take more than they give. Other people give more than they take. We all have our own internal idea of where that balance sits. And maintaining that balance is maintaining the friendship. And when it gets out of balance and we start going, okay, we start down that slope of the lifespan of a relationship and we say, do we want to end this or do we want to work on it and try to get it all back in balance again? But it's it's also an interesting view of cross-sex friends because that is a relatively new function. So the main purpose of this one is how do people maintain friendships for long periods of time? So, you know, the Nees family, for example, 67 years staying married, or the Carters being married 77 years, or, you know, I have friends from high school that I'm still friends with, and that's been, I don't remember exactly how long I've been out of school, 40, 45 years, something like that. Um, how do you maintain friendships that long? You know, there are a couple of people that I'm still friends with that I've known since I was about eight or nine years old. That's a really long period of time. You think you would get sick of somebody by that particular time. And we we see some trends that are common in really long-term relationships. And what you're about to see, CBS News did a study, this particular couple that's in the, in the picture here on the screen, um, had a very long marriage and it's an interesting view because at one point, one of them, because of health reasons, had to go into a care facility and the other one didn't. And so they did that. And then they found out that there was a negative impact to them living apart. And so the other one moved in, even though they didn't have to, and the health improved. And, you know, we talk about relationships are necessary for health. This is an exact view of that. But it also shows you how do these two people, and these two are married, how do these two people maintain interesting relationship and not get bored with each other over an incredibly long period of time? We're going. Behind every great man on our way is a greater we're woman, the so the saying goes. But these days, we gotta hang on. It's Dale, who's the engine behind Alice's wheelchair. Better get your legs off. The Rockies are each 99 years old. They met just after the turn of the last century as kids in the small town of Hemingford, Nebraska. I didn't pay much attention to him, <laughs> really. Did you pay attention to her? Not especially. <laughs> but by the time high school rolled around, Dale looking suave and Alice, the picture of loveliness, things had changed a bit. Do you remember what your first date was? What you guys did? Went out on the hill and parked and looked at the town. You went and parked on your first date? Oh, yes. Through <laughs> <laughs> Christ, our Lord. Amen. Alice was a good Catholic girl, so no kissing and telling here. Suffice it to say that as soon as Dale turned 18, he popped the question. How did you propose? I asked her if she had any money. <laughs> <laughs> they were married December 29th, 1933. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers were appearing in their very first movie together. FDR was in his first term as president, and Prohibition was just winding down. Had Prohibition been repealed in time for you guys to go buy a bottle of champagne somewhere? We couldn't afford that. No. <laughs> Maybe a bottle of pop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By 1958, Dale and Alice were already toasting 25 years together. They were still laughing after 40 years in 1973. Pretty good looking couple. They've yes. now made it 81 years. Is there a, a secret to how you guys have stayed together for so uh -huh. long? What's that? I always let him have my way. <laughs> you always let him have your way. Very good. <laughs> this year's longest married couple. It's such an achievement, the faith-based group Worldwide Marriage Encounter crowned the Rockies 
the longest married couple of 2015. The Rockies were picked from nearly 400 married couples, most nominated by friends and family. 1939, 75 years. Dick and Diane Baumbach yes. thought their marriage of 48 years was long until they founded the Longest Marriage Project five years ago. When we saw 83 years, 79 years, wow. They don't claim the honor is official, but they hope couples like Dale and Alice serve as a reminder of what a lifelong commitment can look like. Is there a common thread that runs through marriages that last seven and eight decades? Yes. Yes. What's that? They do things together, enjoying things together, by compromising and having patience with each other, I think. They're 11. Dale and Alice have five sons, including Tom, now 76. Two for two. He and his wife, Sandy, married 50 years, by the way, visit Dale and Alice at this skilled care facility outside of Kansas City. This has been a busy day. Alice's health demanded she come here, but Dale didn't have to. He got himself admitted because being together turned out to be the best medicine of all. Once Dale came, you know, and got moved in, Alice's, not only her spirits, but her health just improved. I mean, they need to be together. And maybe in the end, that need for another person is the real secret of wedded bliss. What a wonderful ride we've had. After 81 years, Dale and Alice don't want for much, except more time, hand in hand. It does sound like a long time, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it has been a good long time. I always liked that story about that couple. Um, but you see there's humor there and they had that commitment that 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 deep commitment to the point that she goes into the nursing home because she needs for, because of her health and he's living alone and they see her health continuing to deteriorate he decides to go in and live there too and her health goes back up so there's that close of a bond that they literally need each other to stay alive um, and, and there are some, you heard the guy say, well, are there some key things that keep people together for a long period of the time? And of course, <laughs> I loved her answer. I let him keep having my way, but it's actually a lot more than that. And there are four things really that we tend to see that are common in really close relationships. One is they have a deep commitment. So we talked about exchange theory. You're, we're going to talk about exchange theory and, and comparison level a lot. In a deep commitment, they've decided that that's their balance. The other person helps them maintain their balances of costs and, and benefits. And what, you know, we talked about similarities. They have the right similarities. They have the right things that are different from each other because they help each other out with things that they don't do. Like the example I said, my wife can't cook, which is true. Um, and I can. So there's one <clears throat> benefit that she gets. She gets to stay alive by eating. Um, she has things that I don't do well as uh, also that we balance each other out. And you have that deep commitment. They are dedicated to the relationship. And if you remember back to the lifespan, they have, of course, because no relationship ever is without trouble, they've started down that downward slope of the lifespan, and they reached that point where, it, where the maintenance circle meets the termination circle, and they've decided, nope, I am dedicated to this relationship. I'm going to do what's necessary in order to keep the relationship going. So if you go back to that film clip I showed you of Jennifer Aniston from The Breakup, at, you know, he's like, I won't, I'm not going to the ballet. The ballet's horrible, blah, blah, blah. And she says, it's not about you liking the ballet. It's about you loving the person that likes the ballet that matters. And people in, in close relationships have that deep commitment where they go, yep, they like the ballet. I'm going to the ballet with them, even though I hate it. But they go to stuff with me too, even though they don't like it. The, the commitment says, 
I value the relationship more than my own personal needs. Because you remember at the top of the lifespan slope, it went from us, we as everything to where there's some differentiation and there's me time and we time. They get this balance and they understand they need both. And sometimes that means you sacrifice your own personal need time for the, the couple's need time. So they have this incredibly deep commitment to the point that it affects each other's health. Like in, in the case of the video you just saw and, and her health starts to go down and he moves in, even though he doesn't have to, because the cost is a lot higher and you know, you're not at your own home. And there's a lot of negatives to that, but he goes ahead and does it because her health matters that much. And so he gives up a little bit of his freedom, so to speak, but her health improves instantly almost. And that's that deep commitment or like the knees, they don't want to be apart. They don't want to live without the other. My dogs are getting rowdy at home. I'm at home doing this. Um, they don't want to live without the other and they actually die, you know, relatively close two hours apart from each other. So they have that deep commitment. The relationship matters the most. The next thing is there's an interdependence. They know they have a need for the other and they really can't and don't want to live without the other one. The, the Whatever the things they each bring to the relationship, unite them and make them whole or that vision of we and us and they depend on each other. And it's not a, oh, I have to have them kind of mentality. It's that together we're stronger than we are independently so they have that interdependence they're going to help each other out they're going to be there for each other no matter what and and really close friends are that way you know they have they'll drop everything for their friend if the need is there um they just go you know you have that interdependence built in the third thing that really close relationships have is continuous investment so we, we talked about similarities. You can't have couples, friends, or significant others where they're both almost identically alike because pretty quickly they become bored because they're already too similar to each other. There's nothing new and it gets stagnant. That's pretty common. Um, you also can't be too different. But couples that are together for a long period of time, again, it's whether it's friends or significant others, they still invest back into that relationship. They will find new things and they share it with the other person. So um, my parents, for example, were married um, 59 or 60 years when my dad died. And um, they continually would do bring new stuff in. Like after my sister and I moved out of the house and we're on our own, they were together and my mom decided to go back to work for a while um, they kind of realized they had hit a rut where everything was sort of the same every day and they needed to invest some, something new into the relationship. And so they sat down together and they thought, okay, let's try something we haven't done. And they went to the local community college and started taking ballroom dancing lessons. Now this was way before dancing with the stars was a thing. And neither of them knew how to dance very well, especially that style. And they probably weren't going to actually go out anywhere to dance like in a ballroom, but it was something to do together that was new. And they went and they actually loved it so much. They took that stupid class four times. They passed it, but they took it four times just because it was fun to go back and do and it was something that they hadn't even thought about doing until they'd been together, you know, 25 years or something like that. So you will go out and find something new and bring something back in. This is where the differences are good because one person might find something, oh, I really kind of like this thing. And they come back and they bring it in. It's like, oh, I kind of like this too. And, you know, in my own situation, I've been married 30 years and my wife decided to start really looking into yoga. and. I was not honestly interested at all at the beginning, but I noticed a kind of change in her. And so I started doing it with her and it's actually kind of fun. And it's something new that you get to do together. And so couples that are have that deep relationship for a long period of time, 
they realize we can't let it get too stagnant. So they bring new things in as time goes on and it sort of reinvigorates or renews the relationship. That's that relationship maintenance loop in the lifespan. That's how they kind of get back to the upward climb on the, um, on the lifespan because now they're investing new things in and they're doing new things together that they hadn't done before. And it brings them closer together. You noticed that couple in the video you just watched, they're playing games together, granted they're playing with their kids, but they're still doing things like that, even though they've been together all those years, because it's fun to do things together. So they continually invest new things. Then the last thing that is very common, and this sort of relates to that exchange theory, is they've learned how to balance dialectical tensions. Now, that's a big college word. I know that's your big college word for the day. What the hell is dialectical tensions? So dialectical tensions are where you have two things pulling on you at the same time. This fits exchange theory perfectly. So in the in the picture here that you're looking at, connection versus autonomy. So we're at the top of the lifespan. It, the mentality has gone from me and you to us and we and everything is us and we. And then you hit the differentiation phase where it's, my time and us time and my things and our things and my friends and our friends. And they learn how to balance that between I need my own time and we need us time. And both people have learned to balance that. That balance is a dialectic tension. You need both of those goals. And somehow you have to learn to keep them in balance. And they're usually like an opposite of each other. So predictability and novelty is the middle one you want some predictability in life you want some common threads going through there right because we can't ha live in a world of chaos all the time but you also need to bring in new things once in a while so it's again that balance of where do i i keep with the common stuff that we always do and how much new do we bring in and that balance and then the last one openness and closeness disclosure is a huge part of relationships if you remember the lifespan, as we're going up the lifespan, disclosure just gets more and more and more, almost to the point where you're at the top of the lifespan, you share everything with each other. And then as we see relationships start to fall apart, disclosure starts becoming less and less and less. Well, there's also a balance of how much do I disclose? Because we never tell anybody everything you know the jahari window isn't going to be that one pane of openness there's always going to be some stuff over there that we don't share and that's the openness side versus the closeness so what do i keep to myself and what do i share and in really long-term relationships both people know each other extremely well anyway and there's still some things you don't share with the other person because it's just the way we are where is the balance of that because some people are more closed than others so they don't feel as comfortable sharing this is especially true in friend friend relationships they don't feel as comfortable as sharing as much as maybe the other person is way more open they disclose a lot more they found their balance and the other person has found their own internal balance but between the two of them the person who is very open is going to want the other person to be very open too, but the person who's not that open, they're a little more closed, is going to feel like the other person's too open and they're pushing them too hard. So you have to find the balance between those two so that you can maintain a long-term relationship. Those long-term, close, deep relationships have found that balance and they understand where am I and where are they in relation to openness and closeness and connection and autonomy and predictability and novelty? And how do I maintain that balance so that the relationship stays together over an incredibly long period of time? The knees figured out how to do this. And the couple you just watched figured out how to do this. And the Carters figured out how to do it. People who are in really long-term relationships figured out how to make these dialectical tensions how to at least manage them so it doesn't tear up the relationship. So those four things are necessary for long-term relationships. You need to have a deep commitment. You need to have the interdependence and, and, and focus on that. 
you need to have continuous investment and dialectic tensions. <clears throat> and then long-term relationships typically can go for, an incre I mean, you've seen some of them go 82 years. I think that 82 was what that one guy said. They had a marriage that went that long. I mean, think about that because those people have to be over 100 in most cases. Um, another area of relationships that you always got to deal with is conflict. Because you're always, the, the dialectic tensions almost indicate you have to have some conflict. And really, a relationship without any conflict is not a very healthy relationship. Because honestly, somebody's holding back something because we always have some needs out there that's not being met. And, and we'll talk about conflict more next week as well. But how couples handle conflict also impacts lo how long a relationship can stay together. And John Gottman found um, basically four different conflict groupings that couples will fall into that are long-term, sort of, they sort of survive. Some of these are going to seem like, oh my God, they're terrible, they'll never make it. But as long as two people in a relationship dealing with conflict are happy with their exchange theory balance, then the relationship is considered a healthy balance. So the first grouping Gottman came up with was a validating couple and a validating couple recognizes each other's point of view. So let's say you have difference of opinions on something. I'll use, I'll use my wife and I, because we have very strong differing opinions on capital punishment. She grew up in Texas and she believes in the death penalty and I am strongly against it. And we have known this, this is something we talked about real early on in our relationship and I understand her point of view and she understands my point of view, but neither one of us has ever been able to convince the other one that they're right. And we just agree to disagree, basically. And a validating couple in that kind of situation, I recognize your point of view and we can sit and talk about this for a long time and never come to an agreement. We understand each other's arguments. We support each other's arguments. We just understand that we're not going to agree on it. So we validate each other's point of view. And rarely do you ever hear a, a really strong validating couple get into a knockdown drag out argument because they're understanding each other's right to an opinion and that they have an opinion and they'll support that. So it's a very almost calm conversation that goes on. Um, and, and my wife and I are kind of a validating couple. Another type of couple is a volatile couple and you'll see these kinds of couples in the movie you're going to watch you'll probably see a volatile couple and a volatile couple will sound like they're arguing and they sound like they hate each other and they're constantly bickering but they also have other times when they're incredibly close together and if they're both happy with that balance you know Every single thing turns into a fight and they scream and holler at each other, but then they they make up and everything's fine. If that's their love language, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and that they're both happy with that and it maintains their exchange balance, then that's considered a healthy relationship because, again, everything is in balance. The third kind is a conflict avoiding couple, and they typically will avoid all conflict. So anytime there's a disagreement or anything at all, their solution is to just not talk about it. Typically, this leads to failure. You don't have very many long-term couples who are conflict avoiding because if you don't avoid, we'll get into this a lot more next week, but if you don't address the conflict, it just sits inside both people for a while and festers and it eventually builds into a bigger conflict and, and couples usually don't survive this, being both being conflict avoiding it's a it's a very hard thing to overcome but they feel that it's better to not have the disagreement and not have the unpleasantries than it is to argue it out and deal with it and then the fourth couple that Gottman found is a hostile couple this is like the volatile couple on steroids a hostile couple actually gets into knockdown physical fights and throwing crap at each other and i mean it's a very very rough environment to be in they're constantly yelling at each other and again this one's not normally a very healthy relationship they do get their 
opinions out and they get their feelings out and their beliefs out, but it's almost in a harmful way because that's a physical form as opposed to a volatile, which is more of a verbal form. Um, couples usually don't survive that one either. They're usually either, oops, they're usually either, um, <laughs> they're usually either accommodating or volatile, the ones that really make it a long period of time. And volatile, I know it sounds like it's terrible, but if both couples feel, both people in the in the relationship feel like they're in balance, then it does stay a healthy couple. So the first two, validating and, and volatile, typically have a chance. The bottom two are almost guaranteed to be um, a path to going down the whole entire lifespan of a relationship. Then we also find the Gottman found the four, they called it the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which of course is a biblical reference, but there's four um, behaviors that when you see them in a relationship, you pretty much know you're near the bottom of the lifespan. These are still recoverable if both people are committed enough. Remember, deep commitment is one of the requirements. If they have a really deep commitment to the relationship, you can survive this, but it's very hard to overcome criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Um, and this video does a better job of explaining it than I actually do, but just remember that it's possible to overcome it, but these usually indicate the relationship is not gonna make it. You're so selfish. Ugh, what an idiot. It's not my fault we're always late. Forget it. Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Dr. John Gottman calls these negative communication patterns the four horsemen of the apocalypse because they'll lead to the end of your relationship. In fact, he can predict this relationship failure with over 90% accuracy if the behavior isn't changed. So what can you do? Well, at the Gottman Institute, we understand you might not even know you're communicating this way or you might not know how to control it. But if you practice the following four research-based antidotes, there is hope for your future. Criticism attacks the character of the recipient instead of focusing on a specific behavior. The antidote to criticism is to talk about your feelings using I statements, then express a positive need. Contempt is an expression of superiority that comes out as sarcasm, cynicism, name-calling, eye-rolling, sneering, mockery, and hostile humor. Contempt is the greatest predictor of relationship failure and must be eliminated. The antidote to contempt is to treat one another with respect and build a culture of appreciation within the relationship. Defensiveness is self-protection through righteous indignation or playing the victim. Defensiveness never solves the problem and is really just an underhanded way of blaming your partner. The antidote to defensiveness is to accept responsibility, even if only for part of the conflict. Stonewalling occurs when the listener withdraws from the conversation without resolving anything. It takes time for the negativity created by the first three horsemen to result in stonewalling. But when it does, it can become a habit. The antidote to stonewalling is to break for at least 20 minutes, calm down, then return to the conversation. Spare your relationship from certain destruction. Learn more about eliminating the four horsemen by visiting our site. So as he said, you can overcome these. It's it's a little bit difficult. You've got to really have a dedication to the relationship. Um, and they don't necessarily, it's not like they come in this order. Any one of the four of them can appear in a relationship and you it's it's an indicator. It's a good indicator of, hey, you're at a evaluation point of your um exchange balance. Am I to the point where the costs are too high? in the, for this relationship to continue you kind of saw it with jennifer aniston in that movie clip she realized all of a sudden that the costs were too high and he wasn't willing to work on it he wasn't willing he didn't value the relationship enough to make it work so we didn't have that deep commitment and she just said fine you you know do whatever around the house i'm done and he was completely shocked by it they had reached one of the four horsemen and it will 
most of the time kill a relationship off. So you've got to be very careful with that. So the last thing we want to talk about is love languages. And we all have a love language. And you've probably heard this, but we all have something that is our way of showing love for the person that we're in a relationship with. Again, this is friends and significant others. And it depends on what your love language is and what their love language is and how well you meet that. So it's important to know what is your partner or your friend's love language. And if it's not the same as yours, because they don't have to be the same, but you do need to, this is that where they said, okay, what does your partner need? And you heard crickets for a while. This is where you have to sit down and think, what does my partner need and how do they perceive that? And that's where love language becomes very important. So we have, there's acts of service or there's quality time or there's gifts. You'll, you'll, you're going to see a video in a minute that talks about all five love languages. Understanding the other person's love language and working in a way to meet that need is part of that deep commitment that we talked about as being one of the key things for a long-term relationship. You want them to understand it in their language. It's almost as though we speak different languages, like I speak English and my wife speaks French. And so I have to figure out how to let her know how I feel in her language, even though I prefer my language. Um, and she has to do the same thing. And, and we do this with all of our all of our relationships. And it also comes into consideration when we're looking at exchange theory. So this does a nice job of explaining all of that. What's going on, guys? Today's video is going to be on the book, The Five Love Languages, The Secrets to Love That Last by Dr. Gary Chapman. So have you ever been in one of those relationships where you think you're doing everything you can to please your partner, but they're still feeling frustrated and unloved? I mean, you're giving them compliments, you work hard all day to bring home the bacon and pay the bills, you give them gifts, and you even do some chores around the house, but they're still feeling unloved. I mean, what more do they want, right? It's incredibly frustrating and annoying. Well, the reason why they aren't feeling loved, in short, is that you're not speaking their love language. The premise of the book is that people don't give and receive love in the same way. Most of us think that the way we want to be loved is how others want to be loved as well. But this is not the case. There are in fact five love languages. This is huge because if you're not speaking the same language as your partner, then you could be missing the mark completely and not even know it. It's basically the equivalent of a British guy trying to talk to a Chinese guy. It's not going to go well because they're simply not going to understand each other. If you're going to have a strong relationship, you have to know how you and your partner both give and receive love. The five love languages are words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Let's go through each one a little deeper. Words of affirmation. Do you like hearing I love you or compliments or meaningful words above all else? Are insults especially detrimental to your relationship? If so, then this is probably your love language. If you discover that this is your partner's love language, make sure you give them genuine compliments and tell them you appreciate them often. The second love language is quality time. Do you value full and undivided attention above all else? One-on-one -on -one time with the TV off, the cell phone put away, and no distraction is what makes this type of person feel loved the most. Canceled or postponed dates and failure to listen are especially hurtful to this type. If this is your partner's love language, learn to listen better make eye contact more, and spend more time with them instead of at the office or glued to your cell phone. Ask them what they'd like to do with you and then schedule a date to do it. Don't assume what they'd like to do with you. Ask. The third love language is receiving gifts. Sure, we all like getting gifts, but this type of person loves receiving gifts above all else. Gifts to this type of person mean everything because it shows the love, thought, and effort that went into the gift. I'm not talking about materialistic or the cost of the object, but the thought behind it. Missed birthdays, anniversaries, and thoughtless gifts tear this type of person apart. The cost doesn't matter, it's the thought. It can be as simple as a card, or some picked flowers, or a note saying that you love their eyes. The fourth language is acts of service. 
chores around the house, or errands that ease the burden of responsibility are the loving characteristics of this love language. This can be as simple as taking out the trash, paying the bills, doing the dishes, picking up the kids from school, and so on. Broken commitments and laziness can make this type feel unloved. And lastly, physical touch. This doesn't necessarily mean sex. If hugs, cuddling, holding hands, and thoughtful touches are the most important thing to you, then this could be your love language. If their physical presence is crucial to you, then this could be an indicator as well. Any kind of neglect or abuse would destroy this type of person and their relationship. So which one do you most strongly identify with? Keep in mind, you should only have one primary love language. Sure, we may like all those things, but one of them should resonate with you the most. Really think about each one and imagine your partner doing each one in turn and see how you feel. If you're still having a hard time, let's look at a couple ways to figure out your love language. First, examine your childhood. How did your parents express their love to you? What made you feel loved? That may have translated to how you now express and receive it. Another way is to ask what's your first instinct when you want to show someone you love them. Trust your instinct. And the third way is to look at how you've been hurt deeply in the past. What hurt the most? Exploring that can help shed light on what your love language is. If you still don't know, go take the quiz over at 5lovelanguages.com. Now that you know your love language, think about these love languages from your partner's perspective. Can you identify their love language? I highly suggest you ask them to take the quiz instead of assuming what it is. Remember, what we think is an act of love may not be seen that way by your wife, your husband, or your partner. It really is vital that we learn and understand their love language if we want to make them feel loved. So, find your partner's love language and speak it. Do something special once a week to fill up what Dr. Chapman calls their love tank. Your love tank is like the gas tank in a car. You want to fill it up and keep it full. When your tank is full, your love life will be at its best and a full tank can keep you going through trying times and relationship difficulties. If you're not consistently filling up the tank, you'll be running on fumes and eventually you'll burn out. Now if your relationship's already running on fumes, then it'll take a while for the love tank to get full, so keep at it, keep speaking their love language, and over time, your relationship will start going in the right direction. And another big takeaway from the book, Dr. Chapman explains that love is a choice. It's something that you can control. It's a feeling, and even if you lose some of those feelings over the course of a marriage or any other long-term relationship, you can choose to do the actions first, and the feelings of love will follow. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but it works. So that's it, guys. Quick recap. First, you need to find out what your own love language is. It could be words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, or physical touch. And then find out what your partner's love language is. Don't assume what it is. Talk to them about it. Then make a commitment to do something special each week, something that ties into their primary love language. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe. And feel free to check out some of my other videos. Thanks, guys. So it's important to understand what your partner's love language is and meet that particular one. So like in my case, my love language is quality time. My wife's love language is acts of service. So by doing little things around the house, she knows I love her. And then by spending time together, I know she loves me. And that um, clip I showed you with Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn from The Breakup, he, just from that clip, it's pretty clear that Jennifer Aniston's love language is quality time. She wants to spend time together, do things together, even though it might not be their favorite thing. And his, as you can tell, is acts of service. And he's telling her, I'm on the bus, you know, busting my ass every day of the job to bring you home. He's telling her my love language is acts of service. That's what is important to me. And in that case, he's seeing her love language as being the same as his, which it's not. And you see what happens. The, the whole thing falls apart. By understanding what the other person's love language is, you can avoid that. And it's it's, yeah, mine is acts of service, and I appreciate acts of service from Vince Vaughn's standpoint, but I need to go to the ballet and we need to spend time together because Jennifer Aniston's is quality time, so they just need to do things together, not just going to Ann Arbor, which is what he wants to do, but doing both things. So you have to, again, learn how to maintain that 
exchange theory, maintain the cost and benefit balance over a long period of time. So now you're going to watch a movie called I Love You, Man. And the movie is, I swear, I think it was written for these two chapters of the textbook because you will see all of the stuff we talked about Monday, all of the stuff we talked about today are pretty much in this movie. And so by watching it, you get a really good feel of all of the things we're talking about. And it's even things like platonic friendships between men and women, um, same-sex relationships, cross-sex relationships. It looks like how do you build friends? What um, are the criteria for deciding you do want to be friends with somebody and you don't want to be friends? And you're going to see several false starts for friendships. And you're going to see one friendship blossom and 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 become what will probably be a long-term friendship. And you'll see all of the steps that we talked about in the lifespan of relationships. It's just everything is pretty much in this movie. <clears throat> so you'll watch the movie, fill out the sheet that's tied to the assignment. Um, and I am going to put the movie on a separate link right below this one when I put it on the login page so that they're both there. Um, and that's it for today. Um, remember you've got assignments due Sunday night. Next week is week eight. That is the last week of the class. So if you've got outstanding assignments, and I've said this a number of times, but I can't stress it enough. If you have outstanding assignments that you haven't turned in, get those turned in because a week from Sunday is going to be the cutoff and nothing can be taken in for grading after that. So your, your window to get assignments turned in is starting to close pretty quickly. Um, other than that, I'll see you all Monday. Have a great weekend and I'll talk to you later.